Welcome everyone to the Center for Global Development platform for a talk today on a really interesting new book from Tim Harford. Tim is an economist, journalist, and broadcaster. He's written nine books, including How to Make the World Add Up, Messy, and The Million Selling Undercover Economist. He's a senior columnist at the Financial Times and the presenter of BBC Radio 4's More or Less, 50 Things That Made the Modern Economy, and a new and exciting project regarding vaccination that we will turn to at the end of this talk. Um, he was recently made an OBE for services to improving economic understanding in the New Year honors of 2019. We're really pleased to have him here to talk about his new book. We'll kick off with his overview, why, why he wrote the book, why this issue is important, and then we'll turn to a conversation between Tim and ourselves and our, my colleague, senior fellow Charles Kenny here at CGD, and we'll look forward to your comments below the YouTube stream or on Twitter, hashtag CGD Talks. So without further ado, over to you, Tim. Well, thank you very much. I'm absolutely delighted. The, the book came out last week, and this is the first event I've done talking about it. And I cannot think of a better place than the Center for Global Development to, to launch a book about data, because I feel I'm among my fellow nerds here, which is, uh, you know, a wonderful thing. So I should talk briefly about storks and babies. Um, you may, when you were young, have been you know, curious about where your baby brother or baby sister came from. You may have asked your parents, you know, where do babies come from? And they may have told you, as my parents told me, the storks bring the babies. The stork flies in and uh, drops the baby down the chimney or the baby is hanging in a blanket from the stork's beak. And that's where babies come from. And uh, it, by the way, if you have any uh, different theories about where babies come from, I don't want to hear it. You, you may be suspicious of this story, but I can prove that it's true using statistics. What you do is you plot uh, the number of babies born in each country, and you plot an estimate of the breeding population of storks in each country. And if you look at the scatter plot, you will find that the relationship is interocular. It hits you between the eyes. Uh, there are Lots of countries where there are many babies and many storks, and there are a bunch of countries where there are not many babies and not many storks. The correlation is very strong. Uh, and if you would like to see you know, traditional statistical analysis, there is even an academic paper published in a peer reviewed journal. Uh, storks deliver babies P equals 0 0.008. And I'm, I'm sure I don't need to tell you that that indicates this is not a coincidence the statistical relationship is very real. Uh, now, you may at this point be asking, okay, fine, I believe you, so how's the trick done? And it's pretty simple. If you think about large countries, they've got a lot of room for babies and they've got a lot of room for storks. And if you think about small countries, you know, the Vatican City, Monaco, not much room for storks, not much room for babies. And, and that's really all that's driving the relationship. Now, when you hear that kind of thing, you, you think to yourself, of course, yes, you can prove anything you like with statistics. Uh, and you'd have certainly got that impression by reading an elegant little book called How to Lie with Statistics, which was published in the 1950s by a journalist called Daryl Huff. And Daryl Huff explains all of the different ways that statistics can be used to lie to us. Um, he's even got the story about the storks uh, and the babies. And I read this book when I was a teenager, you know, I, I told you I was a nerd and, and I loved it. I learned a lot. It's got cartoons, it's got jokes, it's, it's great. But more recently, I've started to feel uneasy about how to lie with statistics, about what that little book really represents. So for the last 15 years, I've been presenting a program on BBC Radio called More or Less, uh, which has occasionally, uh, uh, featured luminaries from the Center for Global Development talking about development statistics. And, and more or less is a program that talks about numbers and how numbers work and how numbers make sense. But what's made me uneasy is more and more I've come to realize that people think of us as a debunking program. We're a, we're a show that explains to people why they're being lied to. And it, if that's Jim? true, then... 
Yep. Tim, I, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but there's a little box on your recording that says mm -hmm. movie recording has been stopped automatically that we yeah. believe to be on your side. I'm really sorry, audience, That's okay. for this technical interruption, but I don't want you to have to see a box instead of Tim, who's saying something extremely yeah. important. <laughs> now, do you, do you know how I get rid of it? That, uh, let's see. Because uh, I've never seen it before. I, I can see it, but I've never seen it before in my life. Interesting. So, Nor have we. Okay. Neither has him. That's, that's fabulous. Maybe you should go to the <laughs> corner. <laughs> Sorry, audience. A pause for technical issues. Uh, I can look at the video settings. Um, uh, da, 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 da. I'm happy to. I'm happy to take advice, but I've never. Uh, I can indeed see this thing, but I've never seen it uh, before. Um, would you like me to? We can hear you clearly, so why don't we go ahead? I don't know if anyone else is there with you that could take a look at your computer while you're talking, um, yeah. or if you wanted to switch devices and rehook up to the Zoom. Uh, I can try. Uh, I can try stopping the video and starting the video. Yeah, <laughs> no, that's that's good. Not the video, but that doesn't really help. Um, well, uh, I, uh, yes. I think leave and rejoin is my suggestion and just okay. come right back to us. Okay, right. So I'll, I'll let Charles and Amanda just play for time. <laughs> okay. So, um, let me just say briefly that, uh, Tim, um, uh, has a, a background that, that, that stretches back, uh, to DC. So, I first met him, I think, when he worked at the International Finance Corporation here in here in in, in Washington. Um, so he has a, a a strong background in in uh, development economics. And the other thing that uh, I know about Tim, uh, it's obvious from his books. But uh, when I was first trying to write uh, a book for popular audiences, including stuff on data and statistics uh, called Getting Better. Um, the person I talked to at the World Bank who said you must try and do this said and I have the book proposal to show you there is no better book proposal writer than Tim Harford um, and I was lucky enough to get a copy of his proposal um, uh, uh, on which I modeled my proposal which uh, went on to work but uh, uh, I'm, I'm not nearly the success of Tim but uh, what success there is uh, in terms of book sales is is partially thanks to learning from a master of uh, of, of writing, um, and this book is of course no exception. I see Tim is back. I will shut up. I'm, I am back, but I think we still have the we still have the movie recording problem, don't we? Yeah, so we do. But yeah. Beautiful, but really, we're here for your words. Maybe you just yes. turn just off turn off your camera if you'd like. Uh, well, or you I have mean, another I, device. Uh, yes, I don't. We well, we don't have another device. Um, we but uh, well, well, okay. We can try. Uh, if you really, if you want to see how the sausage is made, uh, that that yes. is that That's is an great. alternative. That's better. Let's do that. Let's do that. We get rid of this beautiful camera. Get rid of this beautiful camera. And uh, okay. You were there just we telling us about, of course, this famous book that we have all read about lying with statistics and how yes. it related to your book. So we'll turn back to you. This is perfect. Thank you. Yes. OK, well, th well, thank you very much. I apologize for the, the sudden um, retreat to a lo-fi camera. Um, so uh, Daryl Huff's book, published in 1953, just gave this this endless impression, I think, of um, statistics as never being trustworthy. They would never tell you the truth. It, it was always, it was like a stage magician's trick. And uh, Daryl Huff, as the, the, the revealer of how the trick was done, would let you in on the secret. But you should never ever take them seriously. You should never ever believe them. And I've realized that we all tend to, uh, as geeks, fall into that trap. It's very easy to explain uh, st you know, statistics in terms of what's going wrong, in terms of, oh, a politician said something that's not true, a newspaper made a mistake. When you think about all the great books you, you may have read about statistics, many of them fall into that category. 
So as John Allen Paulos's book, Innumeracy, a mathematician reads the newspaper. Uh, there's Ben Goldacre's book, Bad Science. And these are great, great books. Um, and yet it's still on this idea of lies, damn lies and statistics. And what really made me think was the discovery that the same year that Daryl Huff published uh, his, his book, How to Lie with Statistics, it was the year that two British epidemiologists, Richard Doll and Austin Bradford Hill, provided some of the first compelling evidence that smoking cigarettes will dramatically increase your risk of lung cancer. So you have these two different visions of statistics that at the same moment, one guy saying, it's a, it's a joke, it's a trick, and I'll tell you how the trick's done. And these two epidemiologists saying, it's, this is life or death stuff. And of course, for over the last year, we've really seen that same message uh, driven home. There are a lot of people who are interested in using statistics to win political arguments. There's a lot of doubt, there's a lot of mistrust. Um, I, I, I have to say my own prime minister, Boris Johnson, recently went on television to announce that the, uh, the AstraZeneca vaccine was extremely efficacious, at which point I thought, oh no, I thought the vaccine really worked, but it obviously can't, Boris Johnson says it does. I mean, that's where, that's where we've got um, to trust in statistics. But at the same time, you look around, you realize just how important these statistics are, just how much information they're giving us. And they're showing us uh, things that we, could, we can't see in any other way. They're giving us information that we can't access in any, in any other way and helping us make life or death decisions. The sad thing about Daryl Huff is in the end, he got sucked into the orbit of the tobacco companies. He was drawn into this idea that you know, they found as their perfect rebuttal to the growing evidence that cigarettes were dangerous. Their, their perfect uh, rebuttal was to spread doubt, to constantly say, well, you, know, you can't believe the statistics, you can't believe the experts, it's terribly complicated. We need to do more research. Uh, experts are divided. And if that sort of thing sounds familiar, well, we've, we've heard the same thing in the time of coronavirus. We've heard, how can you believe the experts? Didn't they tell you that mask wearing was ineffective? Didn't the WHO miscalculate the fatality rate early on? Same, same attack lines. And of course, those attack lines have been used, for example, in talking about climate change and trying to cast into doubt the science on climate change. And it got so bad that Daryl Huff ended up working on a sequel called How to Lie with Smoking Statistics. Um, fortunately for his reputation, never published. But when uh, Senate, the US Senate held hearings to decide whether uh, to put health warnings on packets of cigarettes, Daryl Huff showed up and assured the senators that they shouldn't take all this epidemiological evidence too seriously. It was just correlations. And he told them the story about storks and babies, that funny little story I began with, and insisted that smoking cigarettes and cancer was pretty much the same as storks and babies. You could find a correlation, but could you really believe it? So that's what this book is really about. It is a, it's showing people how statistics can mislead them, sure, but more importantly, is making the claim that statistics are incredibly important. They're a window onto the world. And if we're able to understand our own preconceptions, our own filters and biases, and ask what are actually often quite simple questions, we can get an awful long way to, to making the world add up. So that's really where I'm coming from with this book. And, and um, sorry for the cameras and the, all the exciting technical distractions. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll see how we go. No worries. Yeah, so you're asking us not to be skeptics, but to seek the truth, to be detectives on our own. And, um, you know, of course, it's easy to sow doubt in data. You've given us some good examples. And we in the United States obviously have spent a couple of years really deep in this issue of misinformation and distrust. But on the other hand, there are lots of problems with official statistics in lots of parts of the world. Um, that something like uh, gross domestic product where you would think, oh, it's also, all so standardized. It's you know, so clear what's in and out. It's published so regularly. We all understand that when we see it. 
But then we'll see, you know, an update to a GDP figure that changes it by an order of magnitude. So tell us a little bit about how we should try and walk the line between skepticism and blind trust. You give us uh, some advice in the rest yes. of the book. Well, I'm all, in fa- I'm all in favor of a healthy skepticism. But uh, yes, just be careful because that what feels like a healthy skepticism can turn into something quite toxic and a real cynicism very quickly. So, well, I mean, maybe it's best if I try and boil it down to three simple pieces of advice. I advocate uh, the, the three C's. So uh, calm, context, curiosity. So calm, I emphasize this in the first chapter of the book. So much of what we see is designed to make us upset or angry or feel vindicated, to make us feel that we're incredibly clever, that uh, we're right and those guys are wrong. Um, Social media thrives on emotional engagement, but traditional headlines have always tried to provoke that emotional reaction. And actually opened the, the, the first chapter of the book with the story about an art forger uh, who manages to fool one of the world's leading experts with quite a bad forgery because the expert ends up fooling himself. All, all that expertise misfires, goes into trying to make the case for this absurd forgery because the expert gets carried away with his own emotions. So the first thing I say is uh, just notice your emotional reaction. The second thing, context, is to start asking, well, what's going on with this statistic? Where did it come from? Is it going up or down? Can I compare it to other statistics? And that's not gonna solve every problem. It's not gonna solve the deep technical problems, but often really quite simple questions, even as simple as um, what, what is actually the definition of what's being measured here. Uh, I I mean, I remember uh, when I I first saw uh, a speaker from the Center for Global Development, and it was it was a a, a debate between uh, Steve Radlett uh, and um, and another speaker who was not from the CGD. I I forget her name. Um, And uh, Steve Radlett was just pointing out that depending on what definition you used of foreign aid, you would come to very different conclusions and very misleading conclusions if you used a non-standard definition of foreign aid. And Steve very carefully explained what the proper definition of foreign aid is and what you would include and exclude. And very often it's not the numbers that are wrong, it's the definitions that we've misunderstood. And the third C is uh, ties into everything else in the book, which is just curiosity. Uh, asking, well, what, what does this number actually uh, tell us? What don't I know about the world? And what might I want to know, to know about the world? And when you start digging a little bit deeper and asking these questions, um, you're you're adopting a mindset that's much less threatened by unexpected information. You're you're not tying your colors to a a particular uh, mask. You're not committed to a particular view of the world. You're open minded and you're trying to understand more. So those I mean, that's your that's your basic the basic advice I would give. Clearly, there comes a point where you discover oh, GDP of Nigeria just doubled what happened um that's good you know, and the person in the street is going to be bewildered by that but very quickly you can find very good explanations of the technical issues i mean we we live in an age where we're presented with information on twitter or facebook with with the maximum possible emotional uh content uh trying to wind us up minimal context and we make bad decisions we believe things that aren't true but at the same time we have this amazing resource it's never been easier to get expert comment expert advice uh quick you know the google serves as a calculator as well as a fact checker it it, it is amazing if you want you can go one more click two more clicks and suddenly you understand what's going on so it's a lot of this is about the motivation of individuals what are we really trying to achieve with these numbers. Are we trying to win a fight or are we trying to understand the world? Yeah, well, probably both, right? We want to win our fight and understand the world. So one question for you, in in one section of the book, you talk about these really uncelebrated heroes that are working in national statistical offices or in the congressional budget office that are really paying attention to these definitional issues, to how to calculate right to getting the base numbers correct, running surveys and things like that. Um, 
tell us a little bit about that, about that statistical bedrock. Um, do we do we risk sort of being complacent in terms of their support? Um, what, what, what's your advice there? I think it's really easy to, to take that statistical bedrock for granted. And I think the, the best way to understand how important it is, is simply to uh, look at attempts to undermine it, which we've seen in some uh, Western democracies, um, but we see particularly in, in less developed uh, economies with or less robust democracies. Uh, so we've seen it, I think, I think perhaps the most uh, infamous examples have been statisticians in Argentina uh, being demoted, being sacked, and then being prosecuted for false advertising for doing what you would hope statisticians in Argentina would actually try and do, which is to calculate the inflation rate in Argentina. It turns out not to be a popular move. Uh, this is under the, um, the Kirchner's. Uh, just one detail I, I, can't, I can't resist. The, um, they were told to, uh, to round down all the monthly inflation statistics to the nearest whole number. So if it was, if it was 1.9% per month, that could be rounded down to 1%. If it was 2.7%, round that down to 2%. It's like Argentina's run out of decimal points, sorry. <laughs> Haven't got any more decimal points. You have to round everything down. Um, uh, just, and, and of course, when you compound those, those figures over the course of the year, that makes a huge, huge difference. Um, we saw a Greek statistician uh, coming from the IMF to Greece and then being prosecuted for treason. Uh, for having the temerity to uh, report to international organizations, including Eurostat, uh, what he believed to be the correct numbers and what Eurostat believed to be the correct numbers about Greek debt. Uh, and apparently one of, the, one of the, his crimes was that he didn't allow the committee uh, to vote on what the deficit should be. Um, you know, it's supposed to be sort of democratically decided. Um, and, the, and the most extreme examples, you, I mean, uh, I've been told secondhand uh, statisticians in Africa have been threatened with, all their families will be murdered if they do not deliver the, the numbers that the president requires. And then of course you've got uh, Joseph Stalin who just uh, executed his chief statistician when the census numbers didn't match what Stalin uh, wanted. So when you look at all of those examples, you realize oh, this is actually what's at stake um, you know, autocrats and populists uh, try to suppress honest statistics because they reflect badly on them. And for the rest of us, we need these statistics partly to be able to hold our own governments to account, partly because a lot of private sector businesses are based on these, you know, these data that are gathered by official statisticians. So it's, it's incredibly important not to take them for granted. Um, now, I don't want to be utopian about this and suggest that um, just because an official statistician in a developed country, you know, just because an official statistician in the UK or the US or Germany says something, it must be true. It must always be taken as gospel. It can't be criticised. I don't believe that. Um, I, I do think a, a good starting point is if they say it, it's probably true. And, and if a politician tries to attack them, I'm generally with the statistician, not with the politician. Um, but there are gaps, there are mistakes, they do get things wrong. And one of the things that I've become increasingly interested in um, are the gaps that we sort of choose to leave in our statistical apparatus, because you know, nobody has made the decision to collect this data. Um, one example I give in the book is that the, in the UK, we know more about golf than we know about sexual assault and other serious crimes because once upon a time, somebody decided to commission a survey of victims of crime. And once upon a time, a different person decided to commission a survey of sporting participation. It was actually to do with the London Olympics in 2012. And it turns out this, the survey of sporting participation is better funded and larger and has a higher resolution and more accuracy than the crime survey. And nobody ever sat down and said, it's more important to know about sport than about crime. But nevertheless, these two decisions were made somewhere in the bureaucracy, and that's the result. And I spoke recently to um, uh, uh, Alexis of the, uh, the COVID tracking uh, uh, project here, the COVID data tracking project here uh, in the US. And he told me that uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, 
the United States of America did not know how many hospitals there were in the United States of America. It means have quite basic gaps in data. In the UK, um, people use food banks to survive. How many people use food banks? We don't know. They haven't been gathered. We know how many parcels the biggest food banks hand out, but we don't know whether it's the same families coming back every week or whether it's different families in temporary uh, need each time. These are all just data that we, you know, we haven't bothered to fund. And I think it behooves us to be more deliberate, more strategic, to get together with the statisticians, with, other, with experts from other fields, and to say, what don't we know right now that we should know? And also, what might we want to know in the future that we don't currently have the capability to gather? So, for example, a biological survey of the population, which is now being done in, in the UK, maybe it was always, would, would, I mean, it's an expensive thing to do, take uh, blood samples from thousands of people, but maybe it would always have been a good idea to have that. And it would have helped us to discover all kinds of things, threats, uh, pandemic and otherwise, uh, long before they became apparent by other means. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one one statistic that is incredible to me that we don't have better information on is just the number of deaths that occur around the world. So the World Health Organization recently updated their assessment, something like 40% of deaths are unreported in Sub-Saharan mm -hmm. Africa. So yeah. how would we know what's going on with the COVID-19 yeah. epidemic in that case? Or for that matter, the HIV AIDS epidemic or all of the other uh, priorities that have been uh, funding uh, programs for so long. So uh, a point is well taken, sort of what is that missing data and how to think about it. I wanted to return to your point about um, these statistics, these bedrock agencies and how important they are. Um, I really, when I look at the United Kingdom, I'm so impressed by the checks and balances in the system. And also the media plays a huge role in accountability on statistics and data. But I don't know if people know that the UK has an Office of National Statistics that's amazing and always had that, you know, week to week hospitalizations and outcomes data that we were all looking at at the beginning of this outbreak. Um, but they also have a data regulator, a statistics regulator that puts out commentary on whether these statistics are fit for purpose, how should they yeah. operate otherwise. So I know you said you were like a fish in water in your own data ecosystem in the UK, but do you have any reflections on the importance of those checks and balances and what you see elsewhere in the world? I think it's useful to have a statistics regulator and um, it, you know, it means that one can agree certain standards for when an official statistic deserves to be called an official statistic. And, and, and occasionally the statistics regulator will strip certain statistics of, of, of their official status. I think the official state, they're called national statistics. And they will say, well, this uh, survey of a police survey of crime is no longer a national statistic because it's so inconsistently reported. It does, we don't have enough confidence in it. And so that does mean that you, you've got a nice green tick by all the national statistics, and you can say that the regulator signed off on this. Um, and other useful things can happen. So for example, um, there are certain standards when um, government departments, press offices, ministers, when they use data, uh, they're supposed to ex explain where that data came from and what the official source of the statistic is. And they're not supposed to make claims about data that are not uh, available to the public. It doesn't always work. So, I mean, just this week, uh, I was reporting on a story where um, the Road Haulage Association, so the truckers basically had said, uh, our business has been decimated by Brexit, trade flows are down two thirds. And the cabinet office, basically part of the government responded and said, no, no, we've, we've got some data and it shows something different. Uh, and they said, well, what, what is that data? Oh, it comes from the ports, uh, from customs. But they, they weren't able to point to the source of the data, the definitions of the data. They, they were rather vague about what the data actually showed. And they're not allowed to do that. Um, this, of course, points to the problem because they did do it anyway. Um, so we can read about it. it. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah. It, it helps. We, can, you know, as a journalist, I can say this is what the government has said. And by the way, in saying that and not supplying their sources, they are uh, defying the um, the standards set out by the National Statistics Regulator. 
So they still do it, but it, I think it, so it helps, but it's not a panacea. And if a politician really wants to um, attack the experts, uh, they, they can do that. They can do that. And uh, uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with all this conversation of the deep state in the United States. This happens in the UK as well. From um, They don't use those phrases. But if the statisticians go in too hard, the politicians will push back and say, well, they're just being paid, paid by the bureaucrats in Brussels or something. There's always a reason to ignore the experts if you really want to. Sadly. OK, Charles, what, what about you? What questions do you have for Tim? I have more, but. Yeah, um, thanks, Tim. It's a, a fascinating discussion and a, and a fascinating um, book. One thing that you talk about a bit and, and is uh, sort of a, a hot topic at the, the moment in, in CGD um, is around sort of new sources of data, if you will. And there's a there's a positive side to the story. You know, if, uh, uh, if you don't believe the GDP statistics for Tanzania, uh, you can go to NASA and ask of their data on how much light there is shining out of Tanzania at the moment. And it you know, globally, it correlates reasonably highly with with economic output. And so you can sort of see over the long term uh, is Tanzania probably lying about its GDP statistics and you know, for a long time that was a, a game in, in, in China using sort of statistics they did publish in order to try and figure out statistics they didn't publish and it's you know it's great it allows for, for, for checks but but in the case of NASA they're actually sort of publishing that data and I guess we, we, we apparently trust it um, but a lot more of that data nowadays is being collected by the likes of Google. I mean, take during the recent pandemic, um, you know, a lot of fascinating data on how much people were moving around uh, was, you know, collected through um, mobile phones and so on, um, collected by Google, which as a public good provided it to us, but, you know, it was sort of their decision, if you will. Um, and more and more data nowadays is being held in private hands um, and that you know raises concerns uh, uh, do, you, do you want to talk a bit about that yeah I mean there, there are a few different issues but the, the thing that really struck me um, was that we saw, we've been here before and we've been here before in about 1650 and I know that's going to sound slightly strange but when I look back to 1650 there was this curious moment in the history of science where you simultaneously had early science and you had alchemy. Uh, now alchemy, of course, is the aim of uh, turning base metals into gold and also finding the elixir of eternal life. And uh, spoiler alert, it did not work. Um, but you would have thought that alchemy would still produce lots and lots of interesting results. You know, the quest to do this would tell you all sorts of things. Your failures would be productive and informative. Um, that didn't happen. Alchemy was basically sidelined and what we now know as chemistry took over. Okay, so why is that? Uh, why, why did one form of inquiry become dominant? So here are a few, a few hypotheses. One is, well, the chemists did lots of experiments uh, and the alchemists didn't. Well, that's just not true because the alchemists were highly experimental, very, very interested in experimenting. It's just their experiments never seem to yield any insight. Okay, so here's another theory. Um, the chemists were much smarter than the alchemists. Um, you know, people like Isaac Newton and, and Robert Hooke. Um, that's not a very good theory either because Isaac Newton and Robert Hooke were, uh, were enthusiastic alchemists. Um, so you've got the same people with the same methods trying to do basically the same thing. And yet one of these fields is leaping ahead and the other one is not. So what's going on? And the answer, I think, is transparency. So science had norms of transparency and alchemy had norms of secrecy. And there's a good reason why alchemy had norms of secrecy, which is that you, if you can figure out how to turn lead into gold, you don't want to tell, tell everyone else how to do it. Um, so and that is a problem. One of the problems is alchemists kept trying to do this thing that couldn't be done because they always assumed that someone else had figured out how to do it and not told them that previous alchemists might have known how to do it and the secrets had been lost. Um, meanwhile, the scientists were, the chemists were performing experiments in public, publishing their results, 
checking each other's work, repeating each other's experiments. Uh, so the same people with the same methods, but completely different norms of transparency. Uh, okay, well, what does, this, what does this tell us about Google and big data and algorithms and all that? Well, I think you can, you can start to see the parallel. Uh, you've got these incredibly powerful methods of slurping up huge amounts of data and analyzing them with very powerful computers and very sophisticated uh, machine learning techniques. But we don't have norms of transparency. A lot of this stuff is secret. Um, yes, some of the tech companies do publish some of their data and some of their lessons, but a lot of it is, is kept secret. And I worry then that we have a lot of nonsense. We have a lot of stuff that's very similar to the problem of, you know, oh, maybe we've turned lead into gold uh, and it can't be checked. So you can see this, for example, with uh, the use of algorithms to determine whether an accused person gets bail or not before their trial. A lot of governments have bought these algorithms, which are not transparent. They're commercial secrets. They're proprietorial because like alchemy, you've got to keep it a secret, right? Otherwise you can't make any money. And governments have just been persuaded that these, these algorithms are effective. Now ProPublica has been looking into this and very, very painstakingly has reverse engineered, uh, reverse engineered the algorithm using freedom of information requests so they could figure out in, I think in Florida or a particularly particular part of Florida, very, very strong um, transparency uh, legislation. So you could find out all about who's, got, who's been given bail, who hasn't been given bail and reverse engineer the algorithm. Having then reverse engineered the algorithm, you can then start asking data scientists to say, well, is it any good? And it turns out probably not. Um, you know, you, it doesn't meet pretty basic standards of accuracy and uh, avoiding bias. But you can only do this after this enormous uh, work by these journalists to bring the algorithm out into the open. So that's what really worries me. It's the potential lack of transparency, which means that uh, we are having life or death decisions made about us. And often our you know, governments are making those decisions because they be they believe the algorithms work, and uh, you know, and yet there's no way to test them. And, and by the way, governments can be incredibly gullible about this. So in the UK, we have this extraordinary situation where, um, the, so we cancelled all the exams because of coronavirus, and then the government panicked a bit and said, uh, "What are we going to do? Well, don't worry, everyone's going to get their grades anyway." Well, how are you going to do that? Because you just cancel all the exams. And they said, well, don't worry, we've got an algorithm. And um, somebody had persuaded them that there'd be this algorithm and this algorithm would, would do this job, which was gonna hand out all these grades to all these children who had not sat any exams. And I think if you stop for a moment and go, well, is that possible? You would say, no, that can't be done. There is no algorithm that can do that. Um, but Daniel Kahneman says that when we're faced with a difficult question, we, we just substitute in an easier question and we don't notice the substitution. So instead, what the algorithm did is, well, can we, can we make the grades look statistically like last year's grades? So the schools will look the same and like girls and boys will get the same range of grades. And, we, you know, you do all that. That, that. that was perfectly doable. The algorithm did that. And then all these uh, students said, these grades aren't fair. And all the teachers said, we agree the, the grades aren't fair um, and the government had to you know, tear the whole thing up and start again. And that was just about governments being gullible about how useful this algorithm was and there being absolutely no scrutiny of the algorithm until you know, it was far too late and the dumpster had been set on fire and, and pushed towards the university sector. <laughs> Honestly, it's such a, it's such a crazy story. Um, so well, we have uh, two questions. Um, so let me first uh, from our from uh, Laura Harnagy. She asks, "Why are experts so reluctant to say that something is probably true?" Which goes to that story that you tell about the epidemiologists working on tobacco and mortality in your first chapter. What would you yeah. say to that? Um, well, I don't know. The right experts, I think, are. Uh, are very comfortable communicating uncertainty. So one of my favorite statisticians uh, here in the UK, David Spiegelhalter, is really uh, very mindful of being able to say, look, we know this with great confidence. We know this with modest confidence. We don't have any idea about this. And he's one of the people who, 
you'll interview him and halfway through, you'll ask him a question and he'll say, well, I don't know anything about that. And it's very, very unusual for someone to go, I have absolutely no clue. You'll have to ask somebody else who knows about the subject. Um, so he's very well calibrated in, in what is known and what is not known. Um, but I think it's possibly a reluctance to, um, uh, there are people who, who just want to paint everything black or white and just say, this is true, this is not true. And there are people who are extremely cautious and just don't want to commit themselves to anything until the evidence is in. And, and the, both of those things can be quite damaging. Uh, certainty plays quite well on social media and indeed on the me you know, on media in general. Um, but you will you can see the, the 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 inverse mistake causing trouble. So, for example, um, we you know we for a long time it was true to say. Um, we don't really have evidence that masks prevent the spread of coronavirus. Um, they probably do prevent the spread of coronavirus. The evidence is coming in, um, but people were reinterpreting we don't have evidence that they work as we have evidence that they don't work. Uh, I mean, in fact, a researcher sent me a, a draft script this morning for the radio programme that made exactly this mistake, and you have to sort of unpick it and go, no, no, no. That study didn't prove it didn't work. That study failed to prove that it worked. That is not the same thing. It's a very different thing. But these, I mean, they're hard to, it's hard, it's hard. The evidence, as I understand it, the evidence is that uh, people who express uncertainty in a straightforward way don't lose trust. They don't lose people's confidence. Um, but I think a lot of experts are, are afraid uh, that by doing this sort of hedging and by expressing uncertainty, they, they may seem to be less credible. It just speaks to, you know, training people to communicate carefully about uncertainty. And this all brings me, you know, this whole book really, to me, seems like a great companion text to learning about the technical aspects of statistics. Um, you know, would you expect, I mean, you can imagine that students could use this very well in something even, um, you know, if you're in a, one of the bedrock institutions, you might also take it to bed with you and read at night. But uh, any any thoughts on that? Yeah, and it's not it is not a technical book. I think it, implicit in what you've said is that it, it's not a uh, an introduction to statistics. It's not like a first first year statistical textbook. Um, it doesn't really talk much about p numbers. It doesn't talk about t statistics. It doesn't. It, it's it's much more. Look, here are the questions you need to ask. And the questions you need to ask, a lot of the questions are about how am I fooling myself? They're not about the statistic at all. They're about how am I coming to the table with some preconception that's already leading me astray. But there, there are questions such as, um, can I compare this statistic to another statistic? Can I compare this number to another number that puts it in context? Uh, I, I, I remember Alan Gelb once pointing out to me that the economy of Chad was smaller than the economy of Bethesda. And at that point going, ah, oh, now I get it. And sort of the right kind of comparison can be incredibly uh, illuminating and insightful. Um, is the number going up or down? Um, where did the number come from? What are the definitions involved? Have we, have we actually understood what is meant? These sorts of questions, they're not hard questions to ask in some ways. They're not technical questions to ask but they can be difficult to ask because we're simply in a hurry. Uh, you know, we want to reach a certain conclusion. We want to, we want to sort of doom scroll to the next tweet. Uh, we want to convince ourselves we were right all along. Um, I don't need to pay attention to that because that's obviously a lie because it's come from a bad person. Um, and so the questions are hard in that they, they require some wisdom of us, but I don't think they require a tremendous you know, degree of mathematical sophistication, for example. I think there's an irony there, though, that uh, that's probably where most scientific papers go wrong, right? It's, it, they get the statistics, oh, sorry, the uh, statistical analysis correct, broadly, you know, they, they, they read the P numbers in the right way. The problem is in some assumption they've made before that, uh, not understanding their own data, not actually asking the question they think they're asking uh, with the data, that kind of thing, seems to be more, more often what actually trips up the experts than the, the sort of 
mathematics of the problem, if you will. Yes, absolutely. Or they know very well that actually their scientific paper answers an extremely narrow uh, question, but they're very happy for other people to lead themselves into believing that uh, it, it's of some broad global significance. And one, one of the examples I talk about, I don't have a particular paper in mind, but just an, an issue. One of the ones I talk about in the book is, um, do violent video games uh, cause uh, children to be violent? Okay, so, I mean, and, and you'll see a, a newspaper headline that says, oh, scientists find violent video games cause violence, or alternatively, scientists find violent video games don't cause violence. Um, but let me describe a, a study to you. So here's a study. Um, they brought some people to a psychology lab. They got them to uh, play Pac-Man, uh, which is an incredibly violent game. I mean, Pac-Man eats sentient creatures alive. I mean, goodness me. Hard to think of a more violent game than that. They got them to play Pac-Man for 10 minutes, and then they asked them to fill in a questionnaire. And from the questionnaire, they deduced uh, that that experience didn't um, lead them to make more aggressive responses. Okay, so that's one possible uh, study. Um, here's another study. Uh, it's an observational study of uh, teenagers uh, in the wild playing Grand Theft Auto or whatever it is, is the, the game of choice these days. A game, game that has uh, you know, murders, uh, knife crime, sexual assault is all in this game. They play this game for 20 hours a week for six months. And these kids are more likely to get in trouble with the police for uh, violent crime. OK, so those are two possible studies. They could both be described as, you know, by this newspaper headline that says scientists find that playing video, violent video games has this effect on violence. The laboratory study is much better controlled. You can run a proper randomized trial and identify a causal effect. But you could say, well, I haven't really measured anything of interest. They didn't play the right game. They didn't play it for long enough. We didn't have a really good measure of violence. The observational study, much better choice of violent game, much better choice of a metric of what counts as violence, but it's a lousy study because it's purely observational. And maybe the kids who, you know, like, you know, to, to go out and do rough things and carry knives and get involved with the wrong crowd are also the kids who like to play Grand Theft Auto. So you could argue against either study or in favor of either study. My point is, most people will just read the newspaper headline and they will never for one second go, what did the scientists actually do? And that, I think, is what's, what makes me sad, that we, we should be showing more curiosity we shouldn't just be reading the abstract. We shouldn't just be reading the newspaper headline. We should say, what did they do? How did they measure it? What did they find? Uh, you know, if it's worth giving our attention to, it's worth giving enough attention to, to figure out what actually happened. Well, the good news is that Twitter now has that step where it asks you, do you want to read this article before you retweet this? It's hard. Yeah. Um, I want to ask a question that's also come in from our colleague, Ranil. He asks, how divorce is related to your last point about the different kinds of study designs and what kinds of questions they can answer and can't they answer? Um, but he asks a little bit about what do you think uh, is the relationship between statistics and causality? You know, of course, you started with a story about correlation is not causation. Um, but, it, you know, he's, well, Ranil says, I feel that this is an ingredient that explains a lot of how statistics is misused and how good science eventually prevails, because data without a causal mechanism cannot help us change the world. That would probably be, that's a, uh, maybe that, that's a somewhat extreme st statement, um, because I think what you're arguing is just the basic descriptive data takes us a long way in some respects. But obviously, this issue of causality is hugely important in how we interpret what we see. So yes. what, what do you think? So I, I agree. Ideally, we want causal data. And ideally, we want to know, we, if we're trying to change the world, we're trying to make the world a better place, we want to know that the actions that we're taking will have a causal impact. Um, my old boss at the, uh, at the World Bank, Michael Klein, uh, once sort of going through a spectrum of evidence that really stuck with me. And you, know, you, you start with, uh, well, we gave the patient the medicine. We don't know if the patient got better. And then you move to, which is where we are with, we still are, unfortunately, with certain aid programs. Yeah, we did it. We've got no idea what happened. 
Then you move up and you go, well, we gave the patient the medicine and, um, and the patient got better. Well, that's something. I mean, that really is something. Um, but of course, maybe the patient would have got better anyway. And you sort of move all the, all the way up to, I'm actually right at the bottom, you've got, we don't actually even know whether we gave the patient the medicine. Uh, we, <laughs> we know, I know I signed the check. <laughs> To pay for exactly. the medicine, or yeah? I mean, this <laughs> goes all the all the way down. Yeah. Um, but right at the top is the is the causal. You know, we we gave the patient the medicine, and we know that the patient got better because of the medicine because we ran a randomized trial, or, or we have some other very very high quality source of evidence. So that's the ideal. Um, but, but you're right, Amanda. There's so much to learn about the world that is worth knowing that falls short of the the causal standard. Um, and I do emphasize, these are often quite, quite simple questions. Insistence on causality really held up the fight to show that cigarettes cause lung cancer. Because, well, do they cause lung cancer? Because here's the thing, there are people who get lung cancer who've never smoked. And there are quite a lot of people who smoke who don't get lung cancer. So that's, right now, for at least for some conceptions of what causality means, you know, where, where's the causality there? Uh, and very senior statisticians argued for a very long time uh, that you, the link was completely unproven. Maybe uh, there was genetics that simultaneously um, exposed you to risk of lung cancer and also tempted you to smoke. I mean, it sounds laughable now. But people like uh, Ronald Fisher, who is the, the leading statistician of the 20th century, believe this stuff. That's why I would say you, you, know, you don't have to insist on, cause, on causal data every time. And also, uh, you need to understand your own biases. I think one of the, the most important things to understand about Fisher is Fisher really liked smoking. And really, you know, he did not want to believe that this habit that he had it's hard to break that he loved got a lot of satisfaction from that it was actually killing him and you'll go a long way towards you know, focusing his incredible intelligence and knowledge of statistics to reaching the conclusion that he wanted to reach so yes causal data is great randomized trials are great but uh we're in trouble if we limit ourselves only to that we've seen i think a really interesting instance of this um, in the debate over the first, first dose, second dose with these vaccines. So in the UK, we've kind of got it alone in that we have, uh, we've started administering first doses and waiting up to 12 weeks before administer, administering second doses, which means basically hardly anybody's had the second dose yet. Um, most other countries, including the US, have said, well, we don't have any data about whether that works. Okay, well, that, I mean, that's true. Uh, why don't you have data about why that works? We don't have data. Well, we've got some data with the AstraZeneca vaccine and it, the data suggests it's fine. The booster shot works even better after a longer delay, but the Pfizer vaccine is very different, different kind of vaccine. Why don't we have data on the Pfizer vaccine? Um, and, and whether the booster shot is fine after six weeks or, or nine weeks or 12 weeks? Why don't we know how, how much immunity you get from the first dose after two months? Why don't we know whether the booster effect uh, is stronger or weaker if you delay for two or three months? Well, the simple answer is because nobody ever did the randomized trial and they didn't do the randomized trial because they were in a hurry. And they were in a hurry for a really good reason because thousands of people a day were dying. And so when they did the original clinical trial, the phase three clinical trial, they said, what is the shortest possible time that a booster shot might work. And they, they decided it was probably three weeks based on experience and some uh, data on antibodies. And they said, we're not gonna wait six weeks, not gonna wait three months. We haven't got time. We're gonna just wait three weeks. Okay. As a policymaker, you, you don't then have evidence of how effective the second dose is if it's delayed, but you've got no evidence that it doesn't work either. And at that point, you have to start fig you know, thinking, what do we do? Um, most countries have said, well, we're just going to stick to what the protocol was decided for the phase three trial. That is a decision that potentially is going to lead to a lot of people dying. And we have to be clear about that. If in fact the first dose provides pretty good immunity 
And if the booster shot works just fine after a three month delay or a four month delay, you could vaccinate twice as many people right now. And right now is when the vaccines are in short supply. Right now is when you're trying to target the most vulnerable people. This is a bit, it's a really big decision. It's a really big call to make to say we, we don't, well, don't have the evidence, so we're not going to do it. Um, so my, my bet is that the UK government has probably made the right decision, um, but we don't know that either. Um, so I'm very encouraged that the UK uh, statistical kind of hierarchy, the powers that be, I think it's the chief medical officer has, has decided, well, while we do this, we're going to run a randomized trial as we roll it out. So some people are going to get a three week delay and some people are going to get a 12 week delay and we're just going to see what happens and they'll be randomly chosen. And by the time we know the truth, it's probably going to be too late for the UK. We're, we'll figure out after the fact that we made a bad, bad mistake or that we did something brilliant and we saved probably tens of thousands of lives, certainly thousands of lives. Um, it'll be too late by the time we found out, but we'll find out in time for other countries to learn. And that to me is the right attitude. By all means, run the experiment if you can, generate the best possible evidence if you can. But if you don't have the evidence, you still have to weigh up the balance of probabilities and do your best. Yeah, and I mean, that's even possible because the UK has such rich data in its health system to be able to do that randomization inside their own um, system of statistics. So uh, some things in the UK work. We're very th lucky. This really did. We'll do another event on that. It's so important. I want to end with you telling us a little bit about your new project uh, about vaccinating the world, which is obviously on everyone's agenda. Yes. Oh gosh, that makes it sound like my project is that I will personally vaccinate the whole world. Which that sounds I, good I, I, too. Yeah. Call me. So, <laughs> um, so yes. Well, it, once people have read the Data Detective and enjoyed all of the wonderful insights, um, they might want to subscribe to the How to Vaccinate the World podcast from the BBC. Um, it's not my only podcast, by the way. I also have a podcast called Cautionary Tales, which I strongly recommend. But the How to Vaccinate the World podcast uh, is um, me interviewing. Uh, experts about the vaccine rollout and it's everything from manufacturing to vaccine hesitancy, medical ethics, the supply chains uh, and these issues like the first dose versus second dose um, and we've been doing it pretty much in real time since the beginning of December so you could go back and listen to these weekly programs and hear the, the, the thinking evolve. Um, we also did a couple of, uh, of special format programs. So I'm, I was lucky enough to be able to interview Larry Brilliant and Bill Gates and uh, Anthony Fauci, and they're all very, very interesting uh, people. So um, I recommend that people check out the podcast. It has been very interesting, really interesting. I've learned such a lot trying to watch everybody scramble to figure out what's going on. Why is it happening? How do we do the very best job of this? How do these vaccines work? All the big questions. Uh, and um, fortunately, in many ways, a, a, at least a partial good news story. It's going to be a very, very long time before you know, everybody in the world has the doses of the vaccine they need. And it may well be that they need, they need fresh doses every year. Um, but we're off to a pretty decent start. Um, I think we should count our blessings. Yes, I, I would concur with your assessment, just because, you know, if you look historically at the time between when a vaccine technology is invented and when it reaches people everywhere in the world, that was 20 to 25 years. And now we're talking about months and weeks. So, of course, it's not where it needs to be. Um, but anyhow, it's a it's a really interesting topic. And I'll look forward to hearing the podcast and, and working more on these issues. But so highly recommend the data detective. Um, and I hope to see it on the curricula of many stats courses around the world um, and to having you back to talk more about how you've seen it uh, taken up in the, in the real world. So th well, thanks a lot, Tim. Thank you so much. Sorry about the adventures with the camera, but uh, <laughs> it's been delightful uh, to join you at the Center for Global Development. Okay, take care. Bye-bye. Bye.